All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Spencer from Horizon Labs, VP of Ecosystem. Welcome to our spaces on Horizon 2.0 tokenomics, uh, following the passage of Zen IP 42407. Um, which I'm sure that you all have committed to memory as a number already, so I don't need to remind you. Um, today's spaces will be recorded, which will be great. So for those who can't join, welcome, you know, in some other type of space and time in the future. Uh, but I'm really, really excited to kind of dive in and talk about this. Uh, there's been a ton of work done on this. We've got all the right people in the room on it. Um, I think that, you know, it's a really important step in the sort of modernization and path forward of Horizon, which I think is no small thing. And I'm sure Rob, that you'll talk about that as well. Uh, but why don't we get started by doing some introductions? I'll kind of pass the mic around and uh, Rob, we can start with you and then we'll get into it from there. Sure, Spencer, thank you. I am uh, Rob, uh, co-founder of Horizon and um, CEO of Horizon Labs. Happy to be here. Um, this should be a pretty fun conversation. Cool. And Gustavo? Hello, guys. So I'm a program manager at Horizon Foundation, and I've been supporting Horizon for years. And on the, I oversee the daily operations of the foundation and assist with the community and management and support. And I'll pass it to you, Spencer. All right. And like I said, I'm Spencer, VP of Ecosystem Growth at Horizon Labs. Uh, Tyler, on to you. Hey, thanks, Spencer. I'm the Director of Finance here at Horizon Labs. Great. And finally, Dom. Hey, guys. I'm a Senior Product Manager here at Horizon Labs, currently working on uh, Horizon 2. Cool. Uh, so, you know, before we kind of really dive into it, Rob, I'm hoping that you can kind of take us through what, you know, we've been sort of doing where we've been, kind of the history of Horizon and how we've gotten here. You know, I talk a lot and I know that you talk a lot about the modernization of Horizon, um, which is really impressive in my mind, because when you go back and you look at so many projects kind of of a similar vintage, they've just sort of kind of petered out over time or are kind of comfortable with what they're doing. Uh, whereas, you know, obviously with Horizon, there's been this kind of consistent push to evolve and go forward. So, you know, it would be great if you want to kind of briefly cover for all of us both the transition away uh, from being a privacy coin as then previously was, but is no longer, and sort of what we're doing right now and how Horizon is kind of working towards becoming the home for ZK. Uh, happy to. And Spencer, I, I like how you frame this and, you know, thinking about this in the context of the vintage of, of other projects that were... Um, you know, that consisted of the world of Web3 back in 2016, 2017, when we launched with Horizon or Zencash back then, uh, the world's changed a lot, actually. Um, you know, and the industry that you see today is very different than the industry that existed back then. Uh, so just think, even though Zencash launched in 2017, May of 2017, the project actually started in, you know, towards the end of 2016. So think about the world of crypto in 2016 and the things that mattered back then. And that's why, um, you know, when, you know, I, I've recently been talking about Horizon as one of these OG projects out there, it, it comes back to that because um, the, there were a set of values in 2016 and, and before then, like even literally back to the Satoshi early days of Bitcoin, um, what values were important to us as an industry, you know, and the value in particular that you know, you know, there were several of them, but the value in particular that we jumped on was this idea of privacy being super important of uh, the world going first digital and then digital going on chain. Um, you don't want the world seeing everything you're doing. Now, our ideas of what we would consider like a first generation privacy platform back in the Zencash days, it, it was it was simplistic, literally around the idea of a privacy coin, which is what Zen was in the early days and is no longer a privacy coin. But there were other values. The other values were things like a fair launch. And what did a fair launch mean? It meant that you didn't have a large pre-mine. Like pre-mines of tokens back then were actually considered really distasteful, guys, at least for like the cypherpunk segment of the industry that we, we came from. Um, you know, so things like that, like actually launching without like large VC 
uh, investor allocations without launching with pre mines, without um, you know, launching with like large team allocations. Literally, the fact that every Zen that exists today has been mined is uh, goes to the core values of the ecosystem that we we're creating. And the, the big value, like overarching value on top of that, the problem that we were trying to solve in the industry was around privacy. Um, you know, of course, simplistically starting with a privacy coin. Um, but you know, we we um, you know had some other ideas, and, and Rolf, like as you know the uh, the um, you know a, a, another one of the big architects of Zencash back then, had all these ideas around uh, other applications that were would advance privacy. You know, you know again centered on having a privacy coin Zen, uh, but then like focusing on a bigger application environment. And guys, like even though we take it for granted today that EVMs and Ethereum are kind of standard for writing smart contracts. And now there's others, obviously, with SVM and, and other platforms. But um, these things, you know, we can say they existed. Uh, some of them existed, like Ethereum existed in 2016, but it did not have anywhere near the traction it does today. and did not have anywhere near, like DeFi did not exist in its current form when Zen launched. So this evolution that Spencer talked about was us basically you know, starting as this OG project with certain core values that I, I think today matter even more than they did back then, especially because it seems like the industry's forgotten a lot of them. And then kind of being on this evolutionary track of not, we didn't have perfect foresight of where the industry was going, but we had some ideas and we had some core competencies that others didn't, like expertise in zero knowledge cryptography, that then we took in certain directions. And, and what I can say in hindsight now is some of the directions we chose ended up being like not as valuable. Like some of the things that we thought, um, you know, having an interoperable network of blockchains, I think will be a gold standard, but maybe we were a little bit earlier um, on it and, and the other frameworks that exist today didn't exist back then to build it with. Um, but we, we were kind of on, on the right track. And now circling back of like all the learnings that we've done, we've had over the years and just seeing the industry evolve and like learning how to deliver technology, uh, and learning how to like we've specialized even deeper in zk and now we we work with very common and super powerful frameworks um and being able to combine these things together and then link it back to our early core values i think is powerful and now that's where we stand today with horizon 2 going out there to market is we have the opportunity to kind of relaunch this thing in a way that leverages everything that we know but linking it back to those core values that i argue are even more important today so anyway, that that's uh, my uh, my summary in a nutshell, Spencer. So hopefully that um, you know that captures w what you were thinking. No, it does. I think it's great. You know, I I'm going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit here, where I think I've heard you say that you know essentially Horizon was kind of one of the first zk projects, right? Um, and you know <laughs> everything that we're kind of seeing now, I don't think it's possible without you know Horizon and you know, sort of similar things like that kind of coming first. And so really what we're talking about now is it's kind of returned to our roots in a lot of ways and sort of pushing forward into that next evolution. Is that fair? hundred percent. No, hundred percent, Spencer. But what, what I'll, I'll say, um, the, you know, the linkage there is Zcash was the first on-chain uh, ZK project. And, you know, it, it's to Zcash that we really owe so much as an mm -hmm. industry and us specifically here at Horizon uh, because we took Zcash tech um, in, in a slightly different direction in those early days. Uh, we weren't innovating on the ZK side yet at that point. Uh, we for sure have since then. And what you're going to see with Horizon 2 definitely does innovate and, and bring things together in, in an interesting, coherent way. Um, but you're right. Like that was part of our legacy of being like one of the first, I think the third probably ZK project that was actually out there on chain. So we're very proud of that legacy. We can pretend that we were the first amongst this group. We won't tell <laughs> Close enough. Um, cool. Yeah, thank you, Rob. So, Tyler, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the proposal in general and sort of what it does and the needs that it fills. But maybe where we can start is with sort of why sort of the old standards for Zen we're not really optimal for growing the ecosystem. And then we can kind of get into why the new ones are. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Spencer. Um, and I think this piggybacks really well on Rob's kind of opening statements about, you know, the history of Horizon and the original vision for ZK applications in the ecosystem and, and how that may have changed. So 
I'm going to get a little fancy as well, Spencer, and drop a, a Zenip number here. But, um, you know, the community went out and supported this vision that Rob uh, has kind of outlined with Zenip 42406, the preceding Zenip on the technical migration um, to Horizon 2. And, and that's what really kickstarted this, you know, tokenomic project and the need for this revision. So, I'm sure most of the crowd here is familiar with how emissions work currently in Horizon and, and the block reward split. Uh, but just as a refresher course there, currently 60% of block rewards go to the proof of work miners on the main chain, right? So um, as we transition to a proof of stake system with Horizon 2, there is there is no more proof of work main chain. There is no there. There's a need to repurpose that sixty percent uh, of future block rewards and emissions. Um, on top of that, now that you know the chains, the main chain and Eon are consolidating into a single chain environment. Uh, there's there's going to be a deprecation of the super node pool and, and no more need for for that uh, tech in the architecture. So that means there's another 10% there um, of future block rewards that also is it needs to find a new home in Horizon 2. So with the passage of that Zenip, we, you know, we're quickly realizing that, okay, there's 70% of future Zen emissions that needs to be reallocated in, in Horizon 2. And, you know, we saw that as, as an amazing opportunity. That's definitely not a negative for the ecosystem. Um, and, and that's why we're here discussing that that reallocation, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, right, because, you know, you, you've seen this firsthand, you know, especially like when we were building out Eon, there was a lot that just wasn't possible. Right. And a lot that sort of restricted from not being able, uh, you know, to have kind of these these new systems in place. So. You know, do you see kind of a world in which we're kind of moving forward with, you know, more sort of grant opportunities, more sorts of ecosystem growth opportunities? And speaking a little bit selfishly here, because a lot of that benefits me and makes my job <laughs> easier and more fun. But, um, you know, I, I think how, what do you think is going to be kind of the net effect in terms of being able to attract and draw projects and keep the ecosystem kind of cutting edge and modern? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think Rob alluded to the fact that, you know, Horizon has never had that benefit as a community. It was a, a fair launch, zero start, proof of work, mining um, economy. So there's never been a, a, a well-funded treasury for, you know, the ecosystem and the community to access. So I don't want to steal Gustavo or anyone else's thunder about, you know, how some of those resources might be deployed. And I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, but the goal was to, to put the resources in place for us to execute on some of these visions that are being discussed. Yeah, and I think that that's a good segue in Gustavo, you know, on your side, right, we know the Horizon Foundation share of block rewards is going to increase significantly. It'll increase to uh, about 32.5% as part of this. So, you know, it would be interesting to hear from you sort of what your hope for and what you see that increase be used for um, you know, and how you think that that might play into ecosystem development, infrastructure, uh, the growth of Zen, the stability of it, and so forth. So I think this increase equips the foundation with the resources to support the long-term network development and adopt a more strategic policy to engage. Whereas now we pretty much have more like day-to-day -day because of like finances and some restrictions in the budget. So I think it will open to new opportunities and partnerships that we couldn't pursue before. We are also focused on expanding Horizon utility and can now support initiatives to improve liquidity on both centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges, which I think is crucial for building confidence in the Zen token. And regarding infrastructure, I think the funds will allow us to integrate necessary features that we previously delayed the lack of funding, and it will also be used to support the ongoing infrastructure needs back to you spencer cool um and rob before i kind of pass it to dom for some of his thoughts i don't know if you had anything else to add there uh no i mean, not really like these, these guys nailed it is um you know there's good and bad with launching the way we did as a completely fair project and again like i like i keep stressing i think 
the fact that we launch as a, as a fair project is going to matter a lot long term, especially as um, you know, tokenomics evolve and kind of like token allocations are spent in other projects. And, um, you know, the fact that now we're circling back with and using this opportunity with the Horizon to relaunch to kind of rethink the remaining tokenomics um, distributions so that we can really point them back towards the community is a way to do it. Uh, I think something that's always been hard for us is how do you crowdsource um, innovation? And how do you crowdsource kind of just like interesting uh, initiatives that can actually grow the ecosystem? And now, um, you know, like some of the partnerships that we're looking to bring on board or other other organizations that want to join our ecosystem or even just others out there that might be listening to this that want to participate. This now gives us finally the, you know, the tools that we're going to need to actually modernize the ecosystem itself. So anyway, I'm pretty pumped for it. I think this is such an undervalued uh you know, Zenep in terms of what changes will come to our ecosystem because of it. But I think it's going to have big ripple effects. Yeah, I mean, I, in my mind, outside of, you know, the technology upgrades and migrations, like this is maybe the most important Zenep, you know, that we've ever really seen, just based on the kind of opportunities that it opens up. You know, I also want to kind of highlight something where you noted that, you know, it does makes sense and will continue to benefit us that Zen was a fair launch token. You know, I think it's really important to note that what we're doing here, it's not like a quote unquote correction, it's an evolution. Um, when it was launched, it was the right way to launch it. Um, and, you know, I think that these changes right now are the right changes to be making in order to kind of move the ecosystem forward. So I'm really glad that you touched on that as well. Um, Dom, I'm gonna ask you kind of a similar question which is, you know, about a little bit under 28, I think 27 and a half percent, um, more or less, of the Zen emissions are going to go to the Dow Treasury. Um, a lot of that's going to go towards grants, towards growth and marketing, um, you know, towards sort of bringing more stability to Zen. In your mind, kind of what do you envision these funds being used for? And, you know, why do you think that that's particularly important, I guess, in terms of, um, you know, remaining hyper competitive? Yeah, so I think uh, this is a, a really good opportunity to use the, the value that we have in order to invest into uh, projects that don't really exist yet. Um, uh, for me, uh, the whole, uh, what, what, what Horizon 2 has to offer is essentially, you know, decentralized computing or uh, blockchain ledgers. Uh, they they bring the positive value of solving the problem of, of, of trust that the fact that you need to trust any centralized authority, uh, but in doing so, what it does is it, it, it essentially makes all the data uh, publicly available. Uh, I won't go into like every uh, piece of thing that that um, zk could solve problems for, but essentially, in, in my view, it uh, it it solves a lot of the issues that that blockchain. Uh, with all the problems that it solves, there are some some things that you know keeping all data available uh, while while using these decentralized applications is not always the best thing. Um, so there's a lot of applications that have yet to be built because of that, and we see that there's going to be a future where there's going to be a lot of these applications being built. Any 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 application where there's a need for confidentiality or, or a need to like obscure data. Um, so what we want to do is we want to be first movers in, in, in those, in those areas. And, uh, there is even applications for which we don't even know, uh, you know, that they'll even be built yet because things are just not possible. So what we want to do is we want to leverage that, uh, funding to invest in these projects and really build like an ecosystem of builders. Uh, that's very vibrant and uh, contributes to the ecosystem. And we want to have a, uh, a grant program that, that funds that, but also a sustainability program for which, uh, you know, Horizon essentially becomes investors into these, uh, into the future of uh, uh, decentralized applications. And we want to work with projects that are really going to make a big dent in, in, uh, in various um, uh, industry sectors, so uh, in doing so, we'll, we'll we'll stand to benefit in the future and keep the the network growing. Um, so, 
allocating the the um, the tokenomics in the way we did, they, I believe that it it puts us uh, in, in a really nice position in order to do that. You said something that I really love, which is you know that so much of this is going to be around promoting you know new products and new types of products. You know, I know that this is something that we've talked about before, and I think it's really, really important here, which is, you know, part of the design of Horizon 2.0 and a lot of the work that you've done on it and a lot of what this pushes forward is, you know, I don't think that we have any interest in just issuing sort of a, a generic all-purpose EVM here, right? Um, you know, the idea here is that Horizon 2.0 is going to be the best place for you know, zero knowledge based applications and use cases. Uh, and, you know, from my standpoint and from an ecosystem standpoint, that's really exciting because it gives it a centering point. Um, so, you know, and, and I also think that when we go out and we look there, you know, out there, if you go and you do like a quick scan of something like GitHub, you'll see that there are tons and tons of projects that could be built here that people attempted to build, um, you know, either a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, and they couldn't really complete um, because of limitations on Ethereum, because of other limitations, things like that. And so, you know, to me, I, I really want to kind of hammer home on that point that, you know, as we're going out and as this budget is open to kind of increase adoption and encourage development, so much of it is going to be around kind of brand new and novel use cases. Uh, Dom, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to, to talk to on that front, but I think that that's super cool and really exciting. Yeah, I would say uh, the EVM, uh, being EVM compatible is really just a secondary characteristic or attribute uh, um, of Horizon 2. The real uh, power that comes from Horizon 2 is that, uh, you know, as there are so many different ways that a ZK app can be built, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the other protocols that are out there are either L2s or they have a lot of limitations as to what uh, what their ZK capability is. Um, what we're seeing is that we've, we we are very bullish on uh, ZK being part of really all computation, not only really decentralized computation because of the positive benefits that it holds. Um, so the real power of Horizon 2 is that it's a decentralized network that, because of its EVM compatibility, does take in uh, or can support a lot of uh, a large part of the ecosystem. But more so is that anybody who builds, say, like a custom ZK application, they're not they're not really um, constrained by you know oh we can only use this ZK snark we could only use this uh, uh, ZK primitive. Really, what we want is developers coming on board and saying, hey, I have this new idea for um, this new game or like, say, this AI software, uh, right? And, you know, if I were to build something from scratch, I want to be able to choose any ZK primitive and I'm, maybe I'm building a new application and a new, new DSL for which there is no ZK snark uh, sort of available for me to use. Uh, and I need to create a new circuit or anything of that nature. Really, what we're what we're focused on is making sure that uh, there is verification possibility with the, the whatever zk primitive this uh, you know venture or developer is using, and that they could use that in a decentralized fashion. Um, so initially, we're going to be very focused on like w what are the what are all of the um, possible ways in which we could verify proofs? Uh, and then perhaps, you know, down, down, uh, down the line, once Horizon 2 is out, like what does the roadmap look like? It's about providing the developers the tools they, they, they need in order to create the applications they're looking to create. And perhaps we could, we, we could deliver other uh, features that make it easier for, for uh, developers to do such a thing. Cool. Um, to shift topics a little bit, you know, Rob, we've heard pretty loudly and clearly, uh, you know, the desire from the community to keep the max end supply 
you know, of $21 million, uh, I'm sorry, of 21 million Zen. Um, you know, this is something that I know you've shown a lot of support for and that you've argued pretty vigorously for as well. Um, you know, as kind of the co-founder of Horizon, you know, which obviously was originally Zencash, um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about why you think that it's so important. And I know that we talked about this a little bit before, but it'd be great to get some expansion on, you know, how you see kind of Zen's OG status playing an important role kind of in the ongoing marketability and growth of Zen. No, oh, totally, Spencer. So I, first of all, there's nothing magical about 21 million. Right? 21 million is is a number chosen by Satoshi for launching Bitcoin. Um, and like in the earlier days of um, like new projects for what ended up being Web3, you know, like a lot of people, you'd kind of like fork a repo and inherit a code base and like many projects would choose to just um, keep the same token supply as kind of like an ode to Satoshi, right? An ode to Bitcoin. Um, that's what we did, right? And and like, there's no, again, there's nothing magical about that particular number. But what is important, though, is linking it back to like, one, having like the point of these systems and, and hard capping a supply like that was actually... Um, to have like in the long run, like uh, you know, solving like one of the one of the reasons why Bitcoin exists today was kind of uh, if you look at the you know um, the um, uh, hexadecimal um, message in the first Bitcoin transaction is actually um, a response to the financial crisis and like central banks like um, printing a ton of currency around it um, to kind of bail out banks. So like that's why these hard caps existed, and we inherited that for a reason because we we also subscribed early on in our culture as a community that we wanted a hard cap um, supply. So uh, what that could mean long term is if the if there's actual traction to the network and usage, you know that essentially is sort of like a deflationary thing, and it provides this kind of uh, value to people that are early. Um, you know, token holders, right? You, you buy the token early on is sort of like, um, you know, a, a bed of confidence that this network is going to build a real community with real utility around it. And over time, the, the token has the possibility of going up. And one of the mechanisms there was having a, you know, cap supply. Not, so not to go too much into that, but like just to say that the part that you, you should tease out of that is there's kind of a cultural component to this, of like linking it back to like cypher, cypherpunk elements, like that kind of, you know, cultural reaction to the bank bailouts that were happening around the world in like 2008, 2009, uh, the, you know, forms the genesis for Bitcoin and from where we came as a project with Zencash. Um, so that, that's why I, I think it was important as we're thinking through changing tokenomics, there was a proposal um, going around where people were talking, like including myself, exploring the idea, does it make sense to radically change the tokenomics, right? To you know, like change everything, like every, is everything up for change? And then I think just feedback from the community and, you know, like it, just what felt right for me as well, was just sticking to the, you know, the cultural origins here of like hard cap 21 million supply in a way that's like a social contract that everyone has bought into by, you know, joining this ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, I think those types of social contracts should be sacrosanct, you know, or at least like very resistant to change and have like very, very good reasons for changing them. And right now, I think we got the best of both worlds is we retain that cultural link. And I think we should emphasize that, guys, um, as a community. Uh, but then we, we you know, uh, had everything else on the table for flex flexible design. And, uh, you know, um, Tyler went into some of the details here and, and the others as well, of like what the possibilities of that are. But within, so just with that one constraint, 21 million hard cap constraint, we retain that, then everything else is on the table for like yet to be emitted Zen. Uh, and I think that was a cool compromise that we had. And, you know, just you see the overwhelming support from the community behind the Zen app, uh, I think resulted from that. I think had we proposed changing the 21 million cap, we would have had probably very different results when it came to voting. Yeah, and I think, you know, to follow up on that, you know, obviously one of the things that was discussed in depth and put on the docket for change was, you know, replacing the having uh, schedule with a more smoothly declining Zen emissions rate. Tyler, do you want to talk to that a little bit and sort of the reasons for it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think this really 
corresponds as well to like a discussion on the thinking around uh, collator rewards. Um, Dom and I in particular spent a lot of time on this modeling, et cetera. And um, just want to get it out there to the community that the goal of setting the forager, um, yeah, the uh, collator rewards where we, where we did is to make sure that there is no crowding out of current super node operators or Eon foragers and delegates. So that was kind of the case scenario that Dom and I wanted to plan for initially is, you know, come one, come all super node participants and Eon forger delegates. And they, we want them to have a home in, in the collator economics. So I think, you know, some people might have noticed that the 40% rewards um, which will be post having of, of Zen, you know, so there's a having that's coming up towards the end of the year. So that 40% in that future state next year, post migration is equivalent to the 20% that is currently being allocated to the super node and Eon forager pools, right? So I just wanted to make sure like that was the, the goal there, um, you know, as a starting point for Horizon 2. And and then secondarily, I guess to to answer your question, Spencer, um, Dom and I like we definitely came across this idea of smoothing the emission curve in uh, researching Zcash and how they're potentially handling their transition to proof of stake. Um, and, and I mean, the the goal simply is to remove any drastic or spastic um, responses in collator economics uh, around a having event that occurs periodically once every four years, right? So we want uh, the collator ecosystem to be smoothly reacting to uh, changes in the emission rate over time. We don't want to have one kind of Y2K-esque event every four years, you know, that the community has to react to in one swift movement. Yeah, it, Y2K is a, is a good, <laughs> um, I don't know, metaphor, I guess, there. Um, but no, that, that, that makes sense. And, and I'm, you know, excited to kind of see what happens with a little bit of that increased stability, um, the ability for people to plan a little bit better and more consistently around it. I think that that's going to definitely be a game changer here. Uh, so thank you for explaining that, Tyler. Um, and then, you know, Dom, to kind of shift subjects for just a, a minute here, you know, you're obviously the product manager leading the Horizon 2.0 upgrade. Uh, can you just kind of briefly take us through where we are in that process on the development side, sort of what's coming next? Um, and then, you know, the always and perpetual question, when? And, you know, kind of go from there. Yeah, perhaps too. What we could do is maybe uh, show what the roadmap is, and uh, basically we're following uh, almost uh, almost exactly, aside from a few new updates, what was originally proposed in the original Zen IP and and all the um, milestones that we need to reach. So I would say we're like uh, halfway through development, um, and uh, the end of this sprint, we're looking to finish completing from a development perspective both a consensus. Uh, staking uh, mechanism on on Horizon Two, as well as preparations for uh, transfer of balances from ZND main chain. Um, uh, what I'd like to talk, what I think is more important to talk about, though, is uh, when we're we're looking to go to testnet in December, um, and and possibly mainnet in, in Q1, and everything seems pretty uh, to be pretty aligned to that. I think testnet is going to be a really important uh, uh, part for us. Uh, for one, it's going to start uh, the building process and uh, the, both the grant, the grant program and possible su sustainability program uh, to get some projects to start building and uh, testing the network. And we want to have an incentivized um, reason to build on, on Horizon 2 during the testnet process. Um, it's also going to be an important uh, uh, part for us to get our partners to, um, to, to prepare them for the launch. And, uh, you know, that's actually going to be a big effort and undertaking. And, um, 
you know, that's that's essentially what we want to do during testing is prepare all of the, the partnerships, but also start the building process. We want people to be be building new uh, applications on testnet uh, that involve uh, ZK uh, ZK computation and uh, pretty much build ZK apps and uh, uh, gear us up for uh, when we do actually go to, to mainnet. So that's a little bit of alpha, right? Incentivized testnet. We're doing it. Yeah, what we what we want to do is we want we want an incentive for you to build on uh, on Horizon. We want to see a vibrant ecosystem of builders. There's a lot of exciting things that we could uh, that we have uh, ideas for 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 certain certain objectives, certain grants, or certain ways that we, we want to incentivize builders. Um, you know, there are, are tons of different applications that we want to see built on Horizon 2. Um, and uh, not only that, we want a vibrant community. So not only builders, we do want people who are going to spread the word and we want to incentivize that, incentivize that behavior as well. Nice. Um, I'm going to go around really quickly and I want to kind of hear what is kind of exciting everybody the most about, you know, the new ecosystem. Uh, Gustavo, why don't we start with you and kind of, you know, what do you see as the most exciting thing from either a narrative standpoint or, you know, from an application standpoint um, or really from any other standpoint? And then we can kind of circle around there. I think for Horizon 2.0, it's a major shift from where we were. And uh, we, I think we are also going to better equip in terms of the governance. And now we are going to have the means to support the, the, the ecosystem with the grants, the sustainability approach. So for me, Spencer, I think it's really hard to pinpoint one thing specifically because uh, honestly, I'm excited with everything regarding this proposal and Horizon 2.0. Nice, Tyler, what are you most excited for? Yeah, I think it's the sustainability initiative. I think that's a really unique thing that we are looking for a lot of community uh, and ecosystem participation in. Um, and and the thinking there is, you know, all about the long term sustainability uh, of of the Horizon ecosystem. Right? We don't want to have a finite amount of rewards. You know, thinking over the next hundred years, we need to begin creating flywheels now for how you know. Um, benefit and and financial gain is returned back to the ecosystem as far as the foundation the dow treasury uh even funding you know proof of stake rewards for collators right um we we need to be seeing long down the road and i think creating um you know commercial structures with protocols that we are funding in the ecosystem and not just having it be a money grab for resources over the next four years is is going to define the success of the ecosystem I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, I mean, I think I, I would also just add to that, that I'm just super, super, super excited to see Horizon kind of take the next step in its story. I know that I was touching on this earlier, but I'll touch on it again, which is I really think that it's no small thing that, you know, Horizon could have just uh, rested on its laurels. We never needed to build, you know, Eon. We didn't necessarily need to be moving towards this, but seeing it kind of grow and evolve is both, you know, really exciting. It's inspiring to me personally. And I hope that people really do kind of catch on to it because I think that it's a really important part of the narrative and just being able to have the ability to kind of go out and do all the things that have been talked about within the community, um, you know, at Horizon Labs, you know, within the Horizon Foundation, uh, for so long and just being able to open all of those possibilities up and push us forward. It just feels like it's going to happen really fast. Um, you know, I don't want to say that it's going to surprise people, but it might surprise people a bit. Uh, Rob, you know, I'm going to ask you kind of the same question. And I would also love to know, you know, sort of what types of apps and builders you're most excited to see join the ecosystem. Uh, okay. So uh, first of all, I, I want to say like, uh, what phenomenal answers from all of you guys. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with all of this and all of the reasons to be excited. Um, so I'm not going to reiterate those, but I'll, I'll 
I'll jump right to, I, I think this is an opportunity for us to kind of get back to our roots and really focus on the culture that is Horizon. And I think culture defines, defines community. Uh, and then ultimately that leads to use cases. So what's interesting for me or what I'm super excited about is um, a, a multitude of things for sure. But um, <clears throat> now we're, from a technical perspective, we're just settling on a framework or <clears throat> like a, a technology framework on top of which we know that we can build out um, the ecosystem, kind of a, a values-based ecosystem that we're going for. Um, and I think it's up to us to define exactly what that values-based ecosystem is going to be. But if it comes back to our roots, you know, maybe we launch as a first-generation privacy platform, and maybe now we're talking about being like a third-generation one or something like that, right? And then that defines, um, like, we're, we're giving a bunch of, um, resources and tools directly to the community with this, you know, this new Zen app that's just passed. Uh, and there'll be, right, I'm really excited for the grant programs that will come about where Spencer said it'll make his, his life easier because he's going to be architecting a bunch of these things. And um, I know there's some really phenomenal partners and tools that are going to come on board to help us grow that out. And wh what that means specifically is help the community take charge of its own grant program. Uh, I think it is amazing. And then that ultimately leads towards like towards what end? And this comes towards like, uh, you know, Tyler's great point of um, guys, this should, this is not a money grab. This is not like if the community sees um, this, like, you know, um, shift into economics and uh, as, as a money grab for people just kind of coming in and, and taking what they can from these grant programs and so forth and not giving back, um, this is going to be a failed ecosystem long term, but if if on the other hand we're judicious about how resources are allocated towards what programs in a way that actually leads towards long term sustainability, we're creating uh, a really cool decentralized like economy or uh, community here um, that can last long term and actually provide some real good to the world. So that's ultimately like I, I'm I'm uh, an optimist optimistic. Um, you know, dreamer in some ways where I, I'm not here guys just for, um, you know, the monetary aspects of what are possible with these ecosystems. I, I, I think that if we don't make the world substantively better in a measurable way that we can point to and be proud of, uh, we're not doing our jobs. So I think all of this is coming together, like enabled, you know, by this one, you know, a series of Zen Ibs and years of, of kind of trial and error as a community from the technology to, you know, how we focus use cases and so forth. But now it's going to, the rubber's going to hit the road with this new, um, you know, the resources that are available here with the, the new technology framework that we're working with um, that is just running like, like a, a machine behind the scenes and, and, you know, gearing up towards the incentivized test net. Uh, and then it's going to be all about use cases and traction. And then we're going to just have measurable KPIs of uh, what types of use cases are generating, what types of network volume, and how is that actually, what contribution of that network volume is actually flowing back to the community directly. These are the things that I'm really excited to quantify and see come to life. Uh, and I think this is just one important piece that of the puzzle that's coming together to make that a reality. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the goals of what we're doing generally is that we want, you know, to decentralize, right? We want to put power into the hands of the community. I think that these systems give us more ways to do that, right? Um, you know, they open up more liquidity. They open up more opportunities, um, you know, whether those be for grants or agreements or, you know, just initiatives. Um, and I, I think, like, what I'm really excited about is, you know, this sort of future where, you know, Horizon Labs is always and consistently a very important and primary builder in the ecosystem, but we're welcoming more and more people in. And I think that that's going to be more possible than it ever has been before because of this. Um, and, and so, you know, excellent, excellent points all around. You know, I think the final question on my end, and maybe Tyler, this is for you, is again, when? Um, you know, when do we think that some of these extra funds are going to be available? And this is also a question for you, Dom, I suppose as well. Um, you know, when do we see this opening up? You know, I know obviously we're doing a lot of the planning and the preparation on our side right now, uh, but what timeline can kind of people expect for this stuff to all go into effect? 
Yeah, I think that's important just to set the tone that, you know, Dom and I and the team did a lot of research of, you know, how DAO and foundation funds have been unlocked for a lot of these leading ecosystems that have had access to big treasuries. And what we what we found is kind of the almost accepted model was, you know, for 25 percent of any of these allocations to unlock at TGE or in our case, that would be migration and then the remaining funds to vest linearly over four years. So divide the re remaining 75% by 48, and that's what's coming out each month. Um, so, and, and then, you know, each of those allocations is definitely going to follow um, a different path, right, as far as unlocking or being available to the community. And Spencer, I think this is your wheelhouse, obviously, but I think what the community should familiarize themselves with is kind of the polka dot governance models right because that's basically going to be uh some of the pallets or some of the systems that are available to the horizon to uh community so we are going to have to adjust how you know the mechanics of our governance but i believe you know that's that's basically where things are trending if that makes sense yeah and you know it's a whole nother ama around that because i think that having studied all of that deeply and, and you guys know this as well there are huge benefits to that model. There are also huge drawbacks, but we have a chance to kind of create, um, I don't want to, maybe I'm just going to start calling it OpenGov 3.0, uh, which sort of, um, you know, fixes a number of the things on there, but that obviously is a whole nother discussion. But this opens that up, right? That wasn't possible before. So it's a great point, and it's really exciting to see, you know, where we kind of boost parts of that, where we put rails around other parts of it. Um, and you know how we kind of use that to kind of build the system forward um you know i don't think that we want uh just the sort of like wild west of polka dot funding through the dow but uh you know we don't have to right and that's one of the nice things about open gov as well but like i said we could talk about that endlessly that's a whole another topic for a whole another time um you know any kind of final thoughts from anybody on the panel uh, before, you know, we see if there are any community questions or anybody has any questions that they'd like to raise. All right. Um, if anybody has a question, would like to raise their hand, now would be a great time. Um, otherwise, you know, we're running up against time here. So, you know, we can sort of go upon our merry ways and get back to work. But uh, now would be the time if anybody has any questions that they would like to raise. Man, shy group. I'm so used to doing uh, AMAs with all of the apes and everybody is uh, jumping on <laughs> questions, but I'm glad I guess everybody understands really well what we're talking about and is excited about it. So, you know, let's go. Dom, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, um, ask questions on Discord if you have any. Um, mm -hmm. I've been um, trying to answer some questions there to, to really talk about Horizon's vision and the possibilities. Um, what you have available to you as well as the white paper. Um, I, I would I would definitely focus on the use cases section of the white paper that really goes into like uh, some of the possibilities, but keep an eye out for testnet. When we go to testnet, there is going to be a lot more information available. Um, we want to really communicate uh, to all of the users and builders uh, during that time. Uh, we'll have documentation ready as well as a lot of um, you know, information on our website that could really direct you, uh, uh, people of interest. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Hype, my friend, it looks like you have a question. Yeah. Hey, finally seeing the tokenomics going through and uh, congratulations guys for all the process going on. Um, I'm really excited to see the journey that Horizon Labs doing and Horizon 2.0 uh, and especially about the ZK Verify. I think that's a brilliant technique uh, approach that you're actually going through with a zero knowledge layer. Um, I, I, I just want to have a question uh, also to the builders here. So you mentioned that on the testnet will be very soon and there is Horizon 2.0 and there is also ZK verified, which will be separate by, but also integrate to the same chain. Do you want to be on the testnet? Like, the goal for the testnet will be on the ZK apps, 
or maybe about the EVM chain. What will be the main purpose on the testnet for you guys? Robert. Yeah, I, I could jump. Yeah, I, I could jump in and answer that one. Um, is so um, we are so Z, you're right. These are two tightly coupled ecosystems with zk Verify and, and Horizon Two because Horizon Two is being launched on top of zk Verify. Uh, and the framework that makes it possible is that uh, is Substrate. So zk Verify is built on Substrate, and then we have uh, basically a, a parachain um, that on top of that, 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 um, is the architecture that, uh, horizon two is using. So, you know, th there is a logical sequence here, um, you know, ZK verified because it's the, the relay chain that, that kind of underlying infrastructure needs to launch first and then horizon two can launch on top of that. Um, so that has to happen, um, at least as a minimum precursor. Now, the good news from a testnet perspective is that ZK Verify has been on a public testnet for the last few months and already has this incentivized testnet launched. Um, and the main point of kind of like what users are trying to attract right now is um, ZK Verify has a really cool um, like dev education program that has, I think, uh, as of now, like 8,500 devs that have gone through it to learn about ZK Verify and learn about what's possible with it to build applications um, that use it. And uh, the next step for uh, Horizon 2 to launch, so Horizon 2 is more about applications. So like if you look at ZK Verify as more of like an underlying important critical infrastructure layer, you've got uh, Horizon 2 is kind of the application layer because it's EVM, uh, it'll just be much easier to build all types of applications that Web3 devs are used to building. Uh, if not easy, even just easily porting over uh, applications that exist on other EBMs. So that'll be much more kind of like uh, DAP dev focused. Uh, and then there'll be, a, like, you know, you could talk to Dom and, and others that are actually constructing the incentive programs, but then we'll also have like really strong community building programs on there. Yeah, I also think um, it's a good point, uh, moment to sort of note the right, there's ZK Verify and there's Horizon 2.0. And Horizon 2.0, you know, we believe is really going to be the best place to build ZK apps. I think it's really important also to just note it's not, you know, a quote unquote ZK EVM. It's an EVM on which to build ZK apps. And so it focuses on a little bit of a different thing there, which I always just want to remind people of. Um, but, you know, I think with ZK Verify, there's this really, really great opportunity and recognition that there are going to be people building ZK apps in lots of ecosystems. There are going to be building uh, ZK apps that may be off chain and want to verify on chain. Um, you know, and so being able to sort of have both sides of that, where we're offering a best in class experience and support and resources to people who want to build directly within the Horizon ecosystem, but also being able to touch people who are building on ApeChain, on Arbitrum, on Ethereum, um, you know, wherever they may be, it is gonna be really, really important in kind of pushing the entire space forward um, and sort of making sure that we're able to kind of bring a suite of products that helps people who wanna build ZK applications no matter where they are. So, you know, I think it's really exciting and I think that it's the right approach because we're not leaving anything on the table there. And I'm excited to see kind of how it goes. Cool. Um, Rob, any last thoughts on your uh, part? Uh, look, guys, I, I mean, without rehashing all of the stuff that you've heard here, um, you know, getting back to why we're here. So the Horizon Horizon has been around for a while, since 2017, again, from Z the Zencash days. Uh, and it is no small feat that we, we are where we are right now, given the vintage of projects that, you know, our cohort appears when we launched, um, because the world was way different back then. The tools, the frameworks, the ways of thinking, the tokenomics, everything was different. Um, here we are now, and I think this is our opportunity to really have the best of both worlds, like have those OG core values that are really meaningful. And again, like I keep arguing, will be even more meaningful long term uh, and combine that with the best of, of, of the current state of technology with like a renewed core kind of vision and mission that matters. Uh, and with now, uh, with the pass, passing of the ZenF on tokenomics, modern tokenomics um, to actually empower all of this. So 
So no, you, you've heard different perspectives on this call, guys. But I, I have to say, just from like the just coming back to basics, this is just super cool to be here, and it's super cool to see how these types of ecosystems can evolve and just get a life of their own. Awesome. So we're just at about time, so we can uh, sort of end it here. But thank you, everybody, for joining. This was a super, super great conversation, really insightful. Uh, we got a little bit of alpha, which is always some of the goal as well. Um, and, you know, I had a great time. And what I would encourage everybody to do is please, you know, follow Horizon on social, Horizon Labs on social, horizon.io. If you want to follow along with progress, there's Discord as well. Um, you know, everybody who's up here has a lot of great and consistent thoughts uh, here on X as well. So please give them a follow. And, you know, thank you so much for joining us and looking forward to the next one. Thanks all.